right, guys. A um, couple of things I need to talk to you about before we get started on this week's lessons. Um, attendance. The state is requiring us to mark attendance every single day for every single student, whether you are in person or virtual. Um, I think it's gone out on Facebook. I think Miss Holly has sent some messages out, but I just want to make sure that you understand what you need to be doing. If you are in person, you do not have to worry about me marking your attendance that day because I take attendance daily as if we're in classroom. If you are virtual, meaning if you come on A days, then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you are virtual. If you're B days, then um, you are going to uh, be virtual three out of the five days a week. So here's what you need to be doing. If you have access to Infinite Campus, then you need to go on the Infinite Campus and you need to mark yourself as participating, as present for the day. If you do not, then it turns into an unexcused absence. All right. Um, this week, I am going to mark everybody as being present. Now, here's what you need to understand. If you mark yourself as being present and I do not get the work for that day, then it will go, I will go back and I will change it to you not being present, which results in an unexcused absence. All right, so it's not just a matter of checking the box. You also have to do the work. Um, and I don't really think I need to explain that to you a whole lot because I think you two are, are pretty good about making sure you get things turned in. All right, second thing, which I don't think I really need to spend a whole lot of time talking about this either, but guys, please make sure you're showing your work. Make sure you are showing me how you're solving your problems. Um, that kind of stuff. Don't just work it out on a scrap sheet of paper and then turn in just your answers. This way, if you miss something, I can go back and kind of look at where you missed it. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with chapter one today. Um, so that starts on page 70. So if you want to follow along with me, you can. We're gonna just kind of go through this. I don't know that we'll do a whole lot um, on paper. Right now, it's going to be more of you, but just let's just kind of go through this and look at it. Um, so a mathematical model, um, we're looking at modeling and equation solving. This should not be something that's extremely new to you, but let's look at it. A mathematical model is a mathematical structure that approximates phenomena for the purpose of studying and predicting their behavior. All right. Um, so we have mathematical modeling. Numerical model um, is where numbers are analyzed to gain insight into phenomena. So we're going to be looking at this. All right, so let's look at example number one. The numbers in table 1.1 show the growth of the minimum hourly wage, or the MHW, from 1955 to 2005. The table also shows the MHW adjusted to the purchasing power of $19.96 using the CPI-U or the Consumer Price Index for all urban com consumers. Answer the following questions using only the data in the table. All right, so just looking at the table, in what five-year period did the actual MHW increase the most? All right, so um, how would we figure that out? Well, it wants to know when did the MHW increase the most? So you're going to kind of look at, okay, so from 1955 to 1960, it increased um, 2,500. Um, 60 to 65, 2,500. So you're going to go through there and you're going to look at that. And what you're going to see is that from 1975 to 1980, is when it increased the most because it increased by a whole dollar there. All right? And if you were, and I'm not going to waste the time uh, or spend the time trying to find all of those. I think you know how to find the difference there, subtracting them. All right? 
Um, but you'll see that 1975 to 1980 increased by a dollar. Now, notice what it says. It says, notice that the minimum wage never goes down. So we can tell that there were no other increases in this magnitude, even though the table does not give data for every year. All right, part B. In what year did the worker earning the MHW enjoy the greatest purchasing power? So you're going to look at the great, the purchasing power, and it wants to know in what year did, he, did the worker earning the MHW enjoy the greatest purchasing power? How would we figure that out? Well, we're going to look at where is the purchasing power the most, the highest. And if you will look, that is in 1970. It's $6.47. All right, part C. A worker on minimum wage in 1980 was earning nearly twice as much as the worker on minimum wage in 1970. And yet there was a great pressure to raise the minimum wage again. Why? Well, let's look at this. Um, we notice on our MHW that it is always increasing. So it said we're looking at 1980 and 1970. So let's look at 1970 and 1980. In 1970 it was $1.60. In 1980 it was $3.10. So it wants to know why did, it, why did they want to raise minimum wage again? All right. Um, look at your purchasing power. In 1970, the purchasing power was $6.47. In 1980, it was $5.90. It dropped. Even though the minimum wage went up, the purchasing power went down. Alright? So, that is one way um, that, that's one reason they wanted the minimum wage to be raised again hoping maybe something will, uh, because the purchasing power is going down, then minimum wage, the more money they make, then, um, you know, it will be, it would kind of even itself out. All right. The numbers in table 1.1 provide a numerical model for one aspect of the U.S. economy by using another numerical model, the CPI-U. Um, working with large numerical models is standard operating procedure in business and industry where computers are relied upon to provide fast and accurate data processing. All right, let's look at example number two. Table 1.2. If you'll look, it'll show you table 1.2. Shows the growth in the number of prisoners incarcerated in state and federal prisons from 1980 to 2000. Is the population of female prisoners over the years increasing? Well, um, so let's look at this. Um, it's, it's talking about the number of female prisoners increasing. Well, if we look in 1980, there were 12, 85, 21, 90, 41, 95, 64, and 2000, there were 92. Um, so, I can't just look at that. What I have to do is it wants to know is the proportion of female prisoners over the years increasing. It looks like with the numbers that um, it is increasing. But you also have to understand that the total number of prisoners are increasing. So, in order to figure out is the proportion of female prisoners over the years increasing, we need to look at ratios, all right? Um, so, if you'll look at the solution, it kind of goes into detail um, what's going on. It says the number of females are increasing. We see that. Um, the total number of prisoners are increasing. So, it's difficult to discern from the data whether the proportion is increasing. So what we need is another column of numbers showing the ratio of female prisoners to total prisoners. All right, so what we would do is we would take 
and put 12 over 316. All right, then we would put 21 over 480. All right, then we're going to do 41 over um, 740. All right, now if you do that, then what you can do is you can look at a percentage. All right, because ratios and percentages go together. Um, so what we would do is we would take and, of course, you guys know this means division. And so if we do that and we divide, then we see that we're going to take our decimal and turn it into a percentage. That would be about 3.8%. All right? Now... I'm not going to spend time doing all of that because it's right here in front of you. If you look at table 1.3, you see our percentages, all right? Um, so they figured out the percentage of female inmates, and um, it shows us that um, every year the percentage of female prison population is in fact increasing all right so we can say yes the proportion of female prisoners over the year is increasing all right so guys the whole point of this is it's not just about looking at the data you actually have to take that data and use it all right so those were numerical models let's look at algebraic models all right an algebraic model uses formulas to relate variable quantities associated with phenomena being studied. The added power of an algebraic model over the numeric model is that it can be used to generate numerical values of unknown quantities by relating them to known quantities. All right, so let's look at this. Let's talk about comparing pizzas, because who doesn't like pizza, right? All right, so it says a pizzeria sells a rectangular 18-inch by 24-inch pizza for the same price as its large round pizza, which is 24 inches in diameter. If both pizzas are the same thickness, which option gives the most pizza for its money? All right, so remember, they're the same price. One's rectangle, one's round. They're the same thickness. They just want to know how, which one's going to give you the most pizza for your money. All right, so we need to compare. So let's think about this for a second. How do we compare this? We would compare our areas. All right, so going back to, um, gosh, I don't even know, probably third, fourth grade, you, are, you learned that to figure out the area for a rectangle, you would do length times width, all right? Um, circle is not one that we use quite as much, but you have um, learned that to find the area of a circle, you multiply pi times radius squared. All right, so let's find the area um, of these pizzas here. All right. So for the rectangular pizza, if we look at this, it tells us it's an 18 by 24. All right. So the rectangle pizza, we're going to do 18 times 24. All right. And when we do that, we get 432 inches squared. So I'm going to get 432 square inches of pizza. Alright, so now let's look at the rectangular pizza. Now let's go back and see what it tells us. It tells us that the large round pizza is 24 inches in diameter. This is where you've got to remember what diameter means. Alright, because not once in our formula does it say I'm going to do pi diameter. I'm doing pi r squared. Well, how do you find the, the um, radius, which is what r stands for? 
of something if we have the diameter? Well, if you remember, radius is half of the diameter. So what I can do is I can do pi, and my diameter is 24, so I can do 24 divided by 2, and then I'm going to square that. All right? So that would be pi, 24 divided by 2 is 12 squared which is 144 pi. Now, depending on the type of calculator you're using will depend on what kind of answer you get. Um, with this calculator, it does not have a pi button, so I'm going to automatically use 3.14 times 144, which is approximately 452 and 1600. Now, if I were using this calculator, and let me get out of this from where I was doing Algebra 2. Um, if I were doing this, then I can actually use the pi button and multiply that times 144. And notice that I get a little bit of a different answer because this calculator will um, take it out a little bit further than 3.14. It's going to use as many digits as it can. Alright, so it's approximately, and we can look at or approximately 452.4. Alright, and if you'll look in your book, they obviously are using a calculator similar to the graphing calculator because they got 452 and 410 square inches. Alright, so now, let's look and see which one's going to give us the most pizza. And hopefully you kind of tried to guess before we did this, but we figure out that the circle pizza is actually going to give us more pizza for our money. And I don't know if you thought about that, but that's, you know, you don't really think about a circle pizza. You think about a rectangle pizza looking a little bigger. So... All right. Um, the algebraic models in example three come from geometry, but you have probably encountered algebraic models from many other sources in your algebra and science courses. All right, let's look at page 72. Um, if you have, well, I tell you what, I'm probably going to assign you exploration one for homework. All right, because I'd like for you to uh, attempt that. All right, so that's going to be one of your assignments, and I'll write all of your assignments down for you. All right, graphical models. A graphical model is a visual, a visible representation of a numerical model or an algebraic model that gives insight into the relationships between variable quantities. Learning to interpret and use graphs is a major goal of this book. All right, so looking at example number four, it says visualizing Galileo's gravity experiments. Galileo Galilei spent a good deal of time rolling balls down in inclined planes, carefully recording the distance they traveled as a function of elapsed time. His experiments are commonly repeated in physics classes today, so it's easy to reproduce a typical table of Galilean data. What graphical model fits this data? Can you find an algebraic model that fits it? All right, so what you would do is you would actually, um, and if you have a graphing calculator, you can do this. If you don't, guys, there are graphing calculators that you can download on your phone. There are graphing calculators that you can, um, you can go on desmos.com. Um, there are free gra graphing calculators out there, but for now, right now, they do this in our books. All right, so you, what you would do is you would um, enter the table data into your calculator, and then you would do a scatter plot. All right, and if you'll look on page 73, it says a scatter plot of the data is shown in figure 1.1. 1 
Galileo's experience with quadratic functions suggested to him that this figure was a parabola with its vertex at the origin. He therefore modeled the effect of gravity as a quadratic function. D is equal to kt squared. Because the ordered pair 1 and 75 hundredths must satisfy the equation, it follows that k is equal to 75 hundredths, yielding the equation d is equal to 75 hundredths t squared. You can verify numerically that this algebraic model correctly predicts the rest of the data points. We will have much more to say about parabolas in chapter 2. Alright, so... Um, This is one of those things that, you know, we might not just use scatter plots. We might use histograms. We might use, um, I don't know, any other type of graph. But right now, scatter plots are what they're using for this. We showed in example two that the percentage of females in the U.S. prison population has been steadily growing over the years. Model this growth graphically and use the graphical model to suggest an algebraic model. Alright, so, um, it says let T be the number of years after 1980 and let F be the percentage of females in the prison population from 0 to 20 years. So, um, creating this table, this is just taking the information that we were doing here. Um, back on page 71, and notice they create a scatter plot. All right, now if you look at that scatter plot, notice it looks linear. It looks like it forms a straight line. All right, so what we can do is we can do, um, we, can use a, we can use a line as our graphical model, and then we can go in and we can find an equation for that line. All right. And this is more kind of things that I need to be able to show you hands-on with the graphing calculator once we get back into in-person school. Alright, um, so go on down and it goes on to talk about the slope. Alright, um, it finds the slope. And guys, you should know how to find slope by now. We've got two points. You can take two points and you can do rise over run. All right, they take the point zero, three point eight, and twenty and six point seven, and they it's remember it's your y's over your x's. All right, so they figure out that the slope is one hundred forty five thousandths, and the y intercept is three point eight. How do I know that? Because that is where it crosses the y axis when x is zero. Therefore, I know from my um, algebra and geometry days, how to create, um, if you remember, y is equal to mx plus b, where m is your slope, and b is your y-intercept. And since I know that stuff now, I can now create my equation. y is equal to my slope, we figured out was 145, um, thousandths x and we set our y intercept where x is 0 is 3.8 so this is my algebraic model for my graph okay We still have quite a bit of stuff that we need to go through, so we're going to kind of go through this quickly. The zero factor property. Um, <coughs> so let's look at this. If you remember the zero, prop the zero factor property, I can take any equation set of equal to zero and I can solve it. I can figure out where my um, zeros are for my equation. Alright, so it says find all real numbers for x for which 6x cubed is equal to 11x squared plus 10x. Here's what I would do. 
I want to set this equal to zero. All right. I'm going to leave my 6x cubed um, positive, so I'm going to subtract my 11x squared, and then I'm going to subtract my 10x, so I get 6x cubed minus 11x squared minus 10x is equal to zero. All right? Notice everything has an x. So I'm going to take an x out. So that leaves me with 6x squared minus 11x minus 10 is equal to 0. Now at this point in time, I'm going to see if I can factor out this equation. All right, which I actually can. I can use 2x and 3x for 6x squared. And for negative 10, I can do 5 and 2, and that would be a negative, and that would be a positive. All right, because when I multiply these two, I should get this. Now, at this point in time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all three of these parts and set them equal to 0. So I'm going to say x is equal to 0, 2x minus 5 is equal to 0, and 3x plus 2 is equal to 0. And I'm going to solve these. Nothing I need to do here. It's finished. I'm going to add 5 here. I get 2x is equal to 5. Divide by 2. So x is equal to 5 halves. All right. And then I'm going to subtract 2. And I get 3x is equal to negative 2. Divide by 3. x is equal to negative 2 thirds. So it says find all real numbers for x. So in other words, I want to know what can x equal that will give me 0. So in, at this point, what I can see is that x could equal 0, x could equal 5 halves, or x could equal negative 2 thirds. All right? Um, so the little box there on page 75 says the 0 factor property. A product of real numbers is zero if and only if at least one of the factors in the product is zero. In other words, if I plug in zero for x, no matter what, I'm going to get zero. If I plug in five halves for x, I'm going to get zero. When I multiply all of that out, I'm going to get zero. All right, example number seven, solving an equation, comparing models. Solve the equation x squared is equal to 10 minus 4x. All right, so I'm going to set all of that equal to zero. So I get x squared plus 4x minus 10 is equal to zero, okay? Now, I'm going to look and see if I can factor this. Because it's a plus and minus, that means I need to be able to subtract my factors of 10 and get 4. Well, 10 minus 1 is not 4. 2 minus 5 or 5 minus 10 is not 4. So it cannot be factored. So now I have to bring out my quadratic equation. All right? So if you remember quadratic equation... Uh, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. All right? So if I have x squared plus 4x minus 10 is equal to 0, my a is 1, b is 4, and c is negative 10. Remember, a, b, c. Okay? So now I'm just going to plug in. There will never, in my quadratic formula, there will never be an x. There will never be a letter. It's always going to be numbers. All right? So let's look at this. Negative b, so negative 4, plus square root of b squared, so 4 squared, minus 4 times a times c over... 2 times a, which is 2 times 1, which is 2. So 
So I get negative 4 plus 4 squared is 16. Negative 4 times 1 is negative 4 times negative 10 is positive 40 over 2. So I get negative 4 plus the square root of 56 over 2. Now at this point in time, they want us to figure out um, what x can equal. Alright? Um, 56 is not a perfect square. So what I can do is I can go to my calculator and I can put that in. So I'm going to do negative 4. Let me do parentheses here. Negative 4 plus the square root of 56 divided by 2, which gives me approximately 1.74166. So it's an approximate number because I can't do an exact. All right, now I've got to do the minus part. So negative 4 minus the square root of 4 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 10 over 2. Negative 4 minus the square root of, guys, this isn't going to change. It's still going to be 56. The only thing changed here is the negative sign. So now we're going to do negative 4 minus the square root of 56 divided by 2, which gives us approximately negative 5.74166. Okay? It says, while the decimal answers are certainly accurate enough for all practical purposes, it is important to note that only the expressions found by the quadratic formula give the exact real number answers. All right, so technically, I would have to use this, or I would have to use this, because those are our real answers. All right? The tidiness of exact answers is a worthy mathematical goal. Realistically, however, exact answers are often impossible to obtain, even with the most sophisticated mathematical tools. Now, you can solve this one graphically, which means um, what you would do is you would graph your equation. All right, so let's graph this equation. All right, so I would have um, x squared plus 4x minus 10. So I graph it, and I can see my zeros here, um, but I don't have exact numbers. All right, so what I would have to do is um, I see it does cross the x-axis, so I would have to do a graph trace. Or I could do a, I could do a, um, it tells me I can do a zero, and see it points that point out to me. Negative 5.74. R's went a little bit more because we actually did a decimal. All right, so I can do that again. Analyze my graph and do my zeros. And I'm going to tell it to do this part over here now. All right, and then look at my zero here, 1.74. Once again, ours is a little bit more because we actually did um, the math to it. So you can, you can solve this in two different ways. You can solve this one algebraically or you can solve it graphically. We use the graphing utility of a calculator to solve graphically. All right. Most calculators also have solvers that would enable us to solve numerically for the same decimal approximations without considering the graph. Um, but you, uh, 
we're going to be looking at paper pencil and we're going to be looking at graphical. All right, so make sure you understand that. All right, so there's a box on page 76 that you need to look at. Um, the fundamental connection. If A is a real number that solves the equation f of x is equal to zero, then these three statements are equivalent. The number A is a root or a solution of the equation f of x is equal to zero. So let's go back here to this one where we're not dealing with square roots of stuff. So um, if A is a real number that solves the equation, so these are real numbers that solve the equation. So it's telling me that five halves would be a root or a solution of this equation. All right? The number A is a zero of y is equal to f of x. So this would be a zero of y is equal to 6x cubed minus 11x squared minus 10x. The number A is an x-intercept of the graph. All right? So in other words, um, this would be my x-intercept, where it crosses the x-axis, okay? So those three things are, are what we know. All right, problem solving. Um, we need to look at problem solving. Four problem solving steps. Understand the problem. Devise a plan. Carry out the plan and look back. I don't know how many times, I don't know how many times problem solving absolutely kills students because we don't, we, we miss the first step, understanding the problem. Making sure that we know what it is the problem is asking. Working through that plan. Um, figuring it out. Um, the problem solving process that we recommend you use throughout the course will be the following version of Ploya's four steps. All right, so let's look at this. Problem solving process, understand the problem. Read the problem as stated several times if necessary. Be sure you understand the meaning of each term used. Restate the problem in your own words. Identify clearly the information that you need to solve and find the information you need from the given data. Step two, develop your plan. Draw a picture. A lot of times pictures help. Introduce a variable to represent the quantity you seek. Use the statement of the problem to find an equation or inequality that relates the variable you seek to quantities that you know. Step three, solve the mathematical model and support or confirm the solutions. Solve it algebraically. All right, support it graphically if you need to. Solve it graphically or numerically. Or solve it graphically or numerically because there's no other way possible. All right, so they've shown you algebraically, numerically, graphically. They're showing you all these different ways to solve things. Step four, interpret the solution in the problem setting. Translate your answer and make sure it answers the question. Whatever you've got, make sure it, it answers what you're looking for. All right, so let's look at example number eight. The engineers at an auto manufacturer pay students eight cents per mile plus $25 per day to road test their new vehicles. A, how much did the auto manufacturer pay, pay Sally to drive 440 miles in one day? And B, John earned $93 test driving a new car in one day. How far did he go? Okay, so let's go back and look at this problem. We're going to take this step by step. We're going to answer A first. So I know that they're paying students $0.08 cents per mile. plus $25 per day. All right. So it wants to know how much did the auto manufacturer pay Sally to drive 440 miles in one day. So it says develop a mathematical model. So at this point in time, 
It says to introduce a variable. What is it we're trying to figure out? We want to know how much did she pay? Did she get paid? So I want to know P is how much she got paid. All right. And we can set up an equation now. All right. Um, in this case, drawing a picture, step two said draw a picture. A picture's not really going to help. I'm not, I can draw a picture of a car and put Sally in it. It's not going to help me. It's just going to show how bad of an artist I am. All right. So we're going to just go ahead and try to work on solving this. All right. So Sally gets $25 for one day. Plus, she gets eight cents per mile. All right. So, Sally is getting eight cents per mile. She drove 440 miles. So, I'm going to have to do, so P is equal to eight cents per mile. And we know she drove 440 miles. All right. All right. Then we automatically know she gets twenty-five dollars per day. All right. So we're and, she, and it says she drove one day. Okay. So now I need to multiply this. So I'm going to get that eight cents per mile. So I get. P is equal to 35.2 plus 25. So the amount of pay that she gets is $60.20. Does that make sense? It wants to know how much did that she get paid to drive. So she's making $60.20. All right. Let's look at John. John has a little bit different. He earned $93 test driving a new car in one day. Now it wants to know how far did he drive. All right, so we know how much he earned. He got six, I'm sorry, he got $93. So the pay, we know that he's getting eight cents per mile, but we don't know that. We don't know how much he's he's driving. So we'll let that equal X. Plus, we know he gets that $25 because it says that um, he drove in one day. How do I solve this? I'm going to subtract that 25. All right. And I get 68 is equal to 0 and 800 X. I'm going to divide by 8 hundredths, and x is going to be equal to 850. Now, am I going to add a dollar sign to this? No, because um, it wanted to know how many miles he drove. So we know that he drove 850 miles. Okay. If I wanted to graph that, I can graph it. Um, and it shows on the next page, it goes ahead and shows you um, graphing that. All right, so we're going to stop here. Um, I'm not going to do this whole um, failure and hidden behavior just yet because I think that's something that we either say for the next time or... Um, Hopefully in person, we'll see. Um, but guys, I will make sure that you have your homework. Don't forget to make sure that you are posting attendance. Have a great evening.